it came back. Ours says recording now. Yeah, okay, it, ours says recording too, so I think we're good. Thanks for your patience, mom. Okay, so boys and girls, I'd like to introduce you to my mom, Dr. Beal. You can say hello to her. Hello. Okay, and mom, I wanted to let you know, can you hear me okay, mom? I can hear you beautifully, darling. Okay, so I wanted to let you know that yesterday we spent time going over the um, document number one, the, the COVID document with paragraphs one, two, and three that you sent us, that source, and going through the quiz questions, and the kids really enjoyed that and understand it very well. And then we went through the peace um, of God and the truth of God. And the kids have a pretty good understanding of uh, the importance of the devolution that you gave us, the devolution of power and making sure that they notice the do dates. And everything that you asked me to, bless you dear, everything that you asked me to is uh, on the board. So we are ready for you to begin whenever you are. Oh, ready to roll. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, as you know, Mrs. Clearman has given me some questions that you all gave me and that other classes gave me. Um, and as usual, Mrs. Clearman has given me a very short amount of time to teach a whole bunch of material and to answer lots and lots and lots of provoking questions. So um, we're not going to get it done, but we will do what we can. I'm trying to answer some of the questions in the talk. So if you ask questions, be sure and listen to see if they're being answered in what we're doing. If we have time, I will, um, at the end of it, I have written down some of the questions which are a little um, off the main subject, such as Vikings and alligators and moats and things like that. And I will definitely try to try to answer that um, at the end if we have time and about the Magna Carta. We're going to start with something that I'm sure that Mrs. Clearman has talked to you about, which is the difference between primary and secondary sources, because that really is fundamental to your understanding any kind of history at all, and possibly even to you understanding each other. Um, history is not about dates. My um, doctor mentor at Berkeley, where I did my graduate work, said he only knew two dates and both of them were 1215. That is the Magna Carta and the Fourth Lateran Council. If I want to know a date, I Google it. Doesn't mean you can't, shouldn't have an idea about what dates were. It's a good idea, for instance, to know that the American Civil War came after the American Revolution, or you're not going to know what's going on. Okay, but other than that, we don't memorize dates. History is about people. Being a historian is it's a bit like a cross between being a detective and being a psychologist, okay? Um, I had a student who actually, he was a returning student, came to take some more classes. This was in North Carolina. And he was the head of the homicide um, murder section of the local police force. And he said he learned more in my class studying how to analyze primary sources than he did in almost all his classes he had taken to become a police officer and a detective. So you really are using it. Needless to say, he had great stories that he brought to class also. Um, suppose then that you're a detective and there's been a murder and you have to figure out how to solve it. Where are you going to go to get the information? Are you going to go to um, CNN? Are you going to go to a journalist or Twitter or something like that? No, I'm seeing some people shaking their heads that there's no way you would. Uh, those people are secondary sources. They have strong biases. Maybe they have an, uh, uh, their advocacy, they're going for have one particular attitude in mind. Maybe it was a family member or somebody they knew who was murdered. So they are very biased. They have their own lens that they're looking through. What you will do is you will go to talk to the people who were involved, you will, um, because they are your primary sources. The journalist, the media, that's a secondary source. So you would go to your primary sources. You'd also look at the physical evidence, such as historians look at animal bones and um, different kinds of seeds to see what people ate. Or we look at architecture and paintings and things like that. Okay, swords, armor, all of those are 
primary sources for historian of the Middle Ages. Then do we ask a primary source? Um, and remember this, this is important. Every primary source you read, every text is a person. That person is communicating with you. If you're trying to communicate to someone, you listen to them. You don't tell them what they're thinking. You ask them what they are thinking. If you went to someone and you're having a talk and all that person did was talk about, was say, this is what you're saying, this is what you're saying, you're thinking, no, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I mean. You have to listen to them, not tell them what they're thinking. So every primary source is a person. But every person is also a primary source. So every one of you is a primary source for where you're raised, what you like to eat, where you go to school, who are your friends, what you read or listen to. You're a primary source for that. And that's why listening to each other is important. And that's why it's important to realize if you want to know something, you'd go to the primary sources, whether it's today or whether it's from 1500 years ago. So the difference between primary source and secondary sources. Um, so historians ask questions of the people who were involved at the time. We don't go to textbooks. Textbooks are sometimes wrong. They have limited access, they have a bias, and they often get their um, material from a half a dozen other secondary sources, all of whom also had a lens or a bias that they were using. So then you get a lot of biases before you reach what the person is actually saying. Yes, the person who wrote the primary source also has a bias, also has a lens. And that's where being a psychologist comes in. You need to understand people. You need to be interested in people. You want to know what makes that person tick. You ask that person certain questions. Who are you? When did you live? How old were you when you wrote this? Are you rich? Are you poor? Are you in the church? Are you a, a warrior? Are you a man or a woman? Why did you write this? Who did you write it for? Who is your audience? What kind of text is it? Is it a letter to your mom? Is it a letter from a wife to a husband? Is it a law? Is it a poem? Is it a peace treaty? Um, it could be a piece of art. It could be a sword. It could be a kind of armor. All of these are primary sources and they help you learn about the people. So that is why when I give you material, such as Mrs. Clearman gave you, I gave you primary sources, what people said at the time, not what many, many people have said afterwards, changing according to what our particular lens or view of history is at this particular time, okay? So go around, celebrate being a primary source. Okay, and celebrate being a primary source together. Yay, talk to one another and say to one another. Okay, just to let you know, I've actually brought in, been brought into classes to talk to other classes at the university because I am a primary source for living in Berkeley during the time of the Vietnamese War and during the time of being the hippie era and during the rise of um, what we could call women's liberation, all right? So I am the best primary source of all. You are just good primary sources, not as good as me. Okay, so, um, so now let's, let's move on to something more direct about medieval history. The next most important thing I really want you to engrave on your respective livers, okay, is the difference between power and authority. These are the Latin words. Okay, I'm giving you the Latin words because the words we use shape the way we think. That's why people say you shouldn't hate words because maybe you're not using it in a certain way to start with, but after a while, the words you use shape the way you think and make you think in those terms. So that's why it's so important to use correct words when you're talking about something and to understand the meaning. The word power is misused in our society all the time, okay? Power means force. It's like a lever. You force something up. You use power. So power is um, killing somebody. 
Power is beating somebody up. Power is money. Money is power. Because if they don't have the money, then people starve to death. Okay. Um, power is anything that forces somebody to do something. That is why I really do not like the way we use it today. I will never talk about women being empowered because women shouldn't be empowered. Nobody shouldn't be empowered unless that power is given for the, the good of the community, such as we give the right to use power to the police force. And that's why it's called a police force, because their power they use to force hopefully criminals off the street and protect the community. So power, you need to be very, very careful. And because we misuse it, I usually give my students the word protestas. If you use the Latin, then you will start thinking more clearly about what it means. It means force. On the other hand, we have a word authority. The Latin is autoritas. Authority is given to somebody. You give somebody authority. Why? Because they earn it. Because you trust that person. You might have, um, you might have a question about how to do something or you're worried about something and you go to your, maybe your grandparents or you go to a teacher or you go to a um, minister or a pastor or a priest or a rabbi and you say, I, I, I need some help here. I don't know what to do. And the person says, well, my advice is you do this. And you go and they say, okay, well, that makes sense to me. And you go and do it. That person has no power to make you do it. I've had um, football players in my class, big, big hulking people. And I say, does your grandmother tell you what to do? Oh, yes. How tall is she? Four foot six. Do you do what she tells you? Oh, yes. Why? Because she has authority. She can't make him do it. She doesn't have power, but he trusts her and he believes in her and he'll do what she tells him to. So mom, can I interject for a minute? Do I have a choice? <laughs> sure, you can say no, but well, I just want to kind of Please, child, when speak. When we are talking about kings and the monarchy versus, um, well, it shouldn't even be versus, but, and then also the Pope or religious authority, she wants you to really understand that a king might have power in terms of physical force and military behind him, Whereas the Pope, have, though, has authority. This is a different, a different thing altogether from power. Am I correct in that, Mom? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So um, in the, when we're looking at the Middle Ages, we're looking at a movement between power and authority. We're talking over a thousand years here, so sometimes it's more one way, sometimes it's the other. People asked about Germanic tribes and kingdoms, the movement of power with them, because they go to battle, they fight each other, they kill each other, they generally have a party and have a great time and all those things. Vikings have power, not authority. Nobody said, oh, we believe in you, you Vikings, come in here and do what you want. No, that's power, not authority. So you watch the movement of it. But very, very basically, as Mrs. Clearman said, the um, king has power and the church has authority. The king has potestas and the church has autoritas. Their roles are very, very clear. They're very, very different. There's no confusion about them. And most of the time they work together. Not always, but most of the time. As I say, we're covering a lot of different periods. Okay, then we get to a lot of the questions about, I perceive, about religion in the Middle Ages. Um, there are three main religions in the West, okay, in Europe. I'm going to limit this to Europe. Um, pagans, Christians, and Muslims in Spain, during most of the time you're talking about. Um, everybody believed in at least one God. There was no such thing as an atheist, there was no such thing as an agnostic, and there was no such thing as a non-religious person. If, um, if Mrs. Clearman woke up one day and she's in her village in the Middle Ages and she says, you know what, I don't think I believe in a God. How would everyone else respond? All right, guys, she's asking you a question. How would they respond? Someone raise their hand. Yeah, Henry. Shun them, he said. They would probably shun them. What else? What do you think? Tess? 
Can you kill them? Mom, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, kill them, shun them. Shun them, kill them. Jesse, is that someone excommunicating them? Okay. But they're already saying that they don't believe. No, 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 exile. Oh, exile. Oh, so I'm sending them into exile, maybe. Okay, well, you're all wrong. Okay. I, love it. I love it when you're all wrong. I set you up for that one on purpose. Well, one of them um, said bash them over head with a big stick. We do that? Bash them on the head. I like it, but no, that's wrong also. <laughs> so um, they would be, what they would do is they, oh, the poor child. She must be crazy. Somehow she's lost her mind. We all have to take care of her because she's obviously nutty as a fruitcake. Okay. No, they would not understand you saying I'm non-religious. Why would you do that? Why would you believe anything so stupid as to being non-religious? It's important for you to understand that the way we live in your particular section of the country is not the way many, many people in the United States and in the world think and believe. If you went into Central Africa or parts of Asia, people would think the same thing. How could you be so stupid as not to believe? Don't think that your way of thinking is the only way that people think or that people should be allowed to think. So religion, somebody um, said, asked me, why was religion important? That's a very hard question to ask, answer. Why is breathing important to you? Okay. This is something so central to people who, who believe in a God or gods. They wake up in the morning, it's in their hearts and in their minds and in their mouths all day, and they go to bed with it at night. Their framework is their God or gods. That is the framework within, within which they live. So it's not why would they believe, but why wouldn't they? You see how you need to turn things so you see somebody's opinion from a different way. It does not mean you have to believe that way. But it does mean you have to open your minds to the way other people believe and why they believe it. Most important question in history is why. When you're trying to understand something, you try to understand why. Not judgmentally, but to understand that person, to unpack what's going on. Okay? So in the West, in Europe, you have one church, that's the Christian church. Until really about the 15th century, 1400s, there is only one church, and that is what is called Catholics. Catholic means universal, and that's what everybody was, they were Catholic. So nobody says Catholics or Christians, because Catholics are Christians. Nobody says um, to, nobody calls the monks then Catholics because, of course, they're Catholics because the Christians and all Christians are Catholic at this time until the Reformation. The church then is a source of authority, not power. As Mrs. Clearman said, the church has no power. In fact, it was not allowed to, um, the, the law was you could never force somebody to be a Christian. It had to be their choice. It was against all church teachings to force them to. Now, that doesn't mean occasionally it didn't happen, but it was against any rules. So it had to be authority. The head of the Christian church was the Pope. Under that is the bishops. Under that is the priests. All right, so that, you guys, is this uh, church diocesan. Uh, Mom, how do you say that? Di diocesan. Diocesan um, hierarchy, right? So it's kind of like, think about when we... Um, studied uh, India and we had our social caste pyramid, our, our social caste system. You have the Pope is at the top, then the bishop, and then the priest. That's how the, the church hierarchy works. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, the, to be a, um, a monk or a priest, you had to give up a number of things. It means a sacrifice. It's not a job. Somebody said the job of being a monk, it, they would not call it a job. They would call it a, a vocation because they would say God called them to do this, right? But it always included sacrifice. It means giving something up. The monks and the priests would give up their name. They would choose another name that was more related to centered on God. They would give up family. They would give up wealth. The teaching of the church was to say, um, you do not marry. You do not have children. You are married to God. Now, there were times within the Christian and then Catholic church 
in which priests did marry. I'll give you a for instance. During the Soviet Union, in places like um, Hungary and Czechoslovakia, if a young man was secretly a priest and he went around a single man visiting people, the KGB, the, the um, communist secret police, would come and arrest him and put him in jail and then kill him. This was generally not good for a person to be killed by the communists. So he, um, he, that what they would do is they would say, okay, they are tracking single men. So the priests were allowed to marry so that they could continue to serve the people who are not be killed. So there were occasions when priests were actually allowed to marry. Um, there were occasions when priests in the Middle Ages married when they weren't allowed to, but that was beside the point. Bishops were never allowed to marry. Popes were never allowed to be married and monks were never allowed to be married. That, by the way, is true of the Orthodox churches, the Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, all those Orthodox churches, Greek Orthodox, as well as the ones in the, in the West. Mom, so, can I, um, can I oh, ask what, what? before you get to the Germanic kingship, which I know is next, uh, next um, and I don't know if you guys had this question, but I have always had this question. It, what is the difference, or is there a difference between a monk and a priest? Um, there is a difference in the monk, actually, I'll move on to that now because some people asked me about um, monasteries today. Right. So um, uh, we'll talk just a minute about monasteries. Um, Benedict of Nursia, known to, um, uh, as St. Benedict, to certainly to Catholics and Anglicans, um, founded the first Benedictine monastery in the, in the 500s. Um, there standard, their motto, their belief was ora et labora. That means to That's pray it. and to work. Ora or is to pray et and labora, to work. And that's what the monks did. And do at St. Vincent's Arch Abbey in Pennsylvania. They grow wheat, they make bread, they, they make stained glass windows, they um, uh, sell stone grained uh, ground um, uh, cornmeal, um, they make beautiful um, rugs, they um, make lace for church linens. There's a Benedictine monastery in um, Chicago that makes coffins, okay? And the FedEx comes and picks them up and takes them away, the coffins away and they're sent out online. So, you know, they're still working, but they're, what? I said, I didn't, I knew they made some things, but I didn't know they made coffins. And I did get a chance to show the kids for a couple of minutes yesterday um, the two videos you sent. We weren't able to watch all of them, but we watched the beginning of the Vesper ceremony so we could see what the, the monastery looked like and the church looked like. And then we watched a little bit of a video on why why young men today might want to become moms. So and, they're familiar with St. Benedictine. Okay, and that, that is St. Vincent's there. And they also serve the community. And you may have seen that in it also. They work in prisons. They work in hospitals. They, they go into places like Brazil. Um, they, um, they, they teach in the college and the seminary. They've, um, um, they do gardening. They feed and, and work with the poor. Um, so monks, very much. Are all of these an extension of what monks did in the 5th century? Exactly. They're exa doing very, very much what the monks did in the past. So the, somebody asked me if they have cell phones. Well, no, they don't have cell phones. Um, they, they cut themselves off from the world in some ways, um, so they don't get distracted by it. They very, very seldom get online unless it's part of their job. Um, but then they would have cell phone maybe if they had to travel somewhere to give a talk somewhere or to care for someone, then they might have a cell phone which they'd turn back in when they come back. Um, somebody asked if the job of monks influence others to spread the word of Christianity more. The answer to that is yes, but not the way you might think. That is, the monks took a vow of stabilitas, stability, staying in one place, and they still do it too in the Benedictine um, uh, monasteries, but everyone came to them. So the monks were the first to have any kind of schools. They were the first to open schools to the poor, to the peasants. The monks started all hospitals are based on what the Benedictine monks did. They had hospices. And so that's why so many of them 
died during the plague because they brought in the, the sick people in the village and they went to the village to care for them. Um, they started universities. The whole university system is based on um, uh, Dominic, who started universities. Um, they started, there was no place to, to stay. If you were traveling across Europe, you had no place to stay. There was no Motel 6, there was no Hyatt. You know, you stayed at the mon uh, monasteries and they protected you and took care of you. Our art, our literature, all our classics from the Romans and the Greeks were copied by the monasteries, okay? So people went to them. And I've talked a lot about the monks, but you also had the convents. You had the women who were there. Um, Hilda of Whitby, who lived in Anglo-Saxon England during the, the um, mid-600s, ran was in um, the abbess of a, what was called a double monastery with men on one side and women on the other. And she was in charge of that, of teaching, of um, the monks wrote poetry, beautiful poetry. In fact, um, I think six or seven bishops were taught and educated under her. Um, another question that I had was what penance did the priests give to sinners that was less than excommunication? Well, it's important to understand the difference between penance and excommunication. We look at what is excommunication. As you've heard, it is being put out of the community. It is not a penance. It is not really, strictly speaking, even a punishment. It's more like being expelled from school. If you're in school and you cause trouble and you're not following the rules and you're doing all this sort of stuff, then people are saying you are endangering the other people in the school. And so you have to leave. Excommunication, ex meaning out of, commune meaning the community. You're put out of the community. Nobody hurts you. Nobody does anything to you. Nobody hits you over the head with a large stick. Um, so, but you are no longer served by the, the church. The other Christians don't look after you. You are outside of it. You can't get have a baptism, you can't get married, you can't get buried in the church, you don't receive communion, and other Christians will not look after you. Okay, You are outside the community. Oaths taken to you are no longer valid. So if you are a lord and you have a knight take an oath to you, that oath is taken in the church in front of God. If you break your side of the oath, then it's no longer valid and they don't have to do it. Penance, penance is not even a punishment. Penance is when somebody has offended God and they want, they need to say they're sorry to God and that they won't do it again. And then they find a way to remind themselves. So um, if you do something really to hurt your mother and then you say, okay, I really didn't mean to hurt you, mom. I'm sorry. And what can I do to make it up? Why don't I stay home and on Saturday and clean up the house for you and help you make your make meals or do whatever you're doing? Um, that is when you're doing it. It's a sacrifice you make, and it's a way of reminding you you did something wrong. Okay, so that's what penance is. It could involve fasting, not eating certain foods to remind you. If you murdered somebody, it might be going and taking care of their families until they are sufficiently can support themselves. Um, but that is very different from excommunication. So Christians looked to the church and to the Pope for authority, not power. Um, the authority is given. The only power, if you can call it that, that the church ever had was excommunication. Some of you may have heard of John Paul II, who was a Catholic Pope, um, who died a while back. Um, when he died, people all over the world of all different religions were watching this on, on TV and things, and they were crying and they were all interested. The only um, power he had was excommunication. He never used it. That is authoritas. That was authority. So let's fast forward because the time is already moving along to the Germanic kingship. Um, the king had a band of faithful followers, the warriors, um, who chose the best leader they could and they swore an oath to him for their loyalty to him. The important thing is they swore the oath to the person. They decided, yes, this person is a really good war leader and I will follow him. 
not to the office. Today, suppose you're in the Marines, you would take a, an oath to obey the commander in chief who's the president. But you're taking it to the office. If the president changed, you don't retake your oath. You have the same oath, okay? You take it to the office of the presidency. You don't take it to the person of a particular president. So a king or a war leader had power, but only the power that his war band would give him and he would enforce. And that comes you to your document on Clovis, where when you're looking at it, notice that Clovis cannot kill the warrior in his war band just for rejecting what the king wanted. Okay, so the king says, I ask you brave warriors not to refuse to grant me in addition to my share, yonder dish. So he says, in addition to his share. So he wants his share and he wants to take it out of the booty, the treasurer, and he wants to take the vase out and give it to this bishop. By the way, Clovis was not a Christian at this time, but being a good pagan, he thought he should stay on the right side of the different gods who were around. Um, okay, mom, I have to confess that I told them, I thought that Clovis was a Christian but that he hadn't converted his tribe yet, that he was sort of working on that. But at no, this point, he's not even a Christian. Because I thought, Clovis is the one that has the whole baby deal, right? The baby guy. A Germanic yeah. king cannot convert, cannot become a new religion unless his, his warrior band, his counselors, and the whole tribe agree. Right, okay. Religion was not an individual thing you picked for yourself, okay? The most important thing, engrave this on your livers also, I just didn't say this bill. I have no more room on my liver. Um, but a good king always protects his people. He must. And one of the ways of protecting the people is choosing the right king, the right God. Right? So he can't go off and choose a God just because he wants to. It has to be one that everyone agrees is going to be best for the whole tribe. So there's no way Clovis would convert until everyone agreed. So Clovis can't kill the warrior in his war band just for rejecting what the king says because legally the warrior was right. So although Clovis with his big double edged battle axe um, is the king and a very powerful king, he still has to obey the law. Okay? He can't break the law. So what does he do? He waits. And in the spring, in March, they come back there. Now, why do we have the word March? We have the word March for our, that month of the year um, because it's from Mars, the um, Roman god of war. And because every spring, that would be spring in Europe, it wouldn't be spring in Wisconsin because they hasn't come yet by March. Um, we have to wait at least till April, but every spring, um, all the armies would gather and they would plan what they're going to do during the summer and who they're going to fight in their campaigns. And so that was called the Field of Mars or the Field of March in which everybody got together to get ready to fight. Notice that at this point that the king can have a legal reason for killing the warrior because if the warrior's weapons are in bad shape, it can um, uh, threaten the security of all the people in the in the war band. We, you might ask yourself, were his weapons really in bad shape? Or was the king just pretending they were in bad shape to have a chance to get at him? I think the king was just pretending to. Right, we read that yesterday. The king probably just used it as an excuse to be able to kill this guy who he was really angry with. And Jefferson, remind us, why was he so angry with this guy? Because he broke the base and said, you don't get to have that is not fair. Yeah. He went against what the king wanted. I will mention something else. I'm almost certain that this is an example of Germanic humor. I think the war band sat around in years later saying, hey, remember good old Clovis when he beat the crap out of that guy because he did this? And everybody laughed and had another drink. Okay, it's, it's hard understanding humors in a different society, but I bet you dollars to donuts, they all thought this was funny as a fit. Oh, the poor soldier, yeah. So, um, anyway, the power the king has has to be backed up by, the, by his war band, and that is the power of maintaining the laws, maintaining ju the justice. Um, the power for the Merovingians, the king, 
came because he was seen as a descendant from Merov, the god. Ing means follower. So in Merov, the Merovingian Ing, he's the followers of a god named um, Merov. Okay, I need to fast forward a little bit. Yeah, um, we have 10 minutes, Mom. What? We have 10 minutes. Thanks a lot. I knew we weren't going to be able to do this. No, so we have, we have vassalism. That is what is when there's the direct loyalty is to the king the, and the king's vassal. Um, you see this, for instance, Beowulf. Then you have the development military and military history is one of my areas of the stirrup. We think it probably came across with the Huns out of what is now Hungary, but in any case, all of a sudden, um, fighters on horseback learnt to use stirrups, which they never had before. The Romans would just go to a certain place and jump off and fight, or they'd use arrows. But people did not fight from, by sword from horseback, because if you've ever tried to, and I have, with a great big old sword on a horse, if you don't have a stirrup and you try to chop off a soldier's on the ground his head, you fall off because you have nothing to brace yourself on. So this was not really good military tactics to try and do that. Once you could brace yourself with a stirrup, then you could fight from horseback. So at the Battle of Tours, Charles Martel had some who were on horseback with stirrups. They were very successful. Everybody said, way to go, Charlie. And they started developing more armed warriors. But horses, you've heard the expression, eat like a horse. Horses eat a lot. So they couldn't all live around the king. So the king gave them land to use spread all over Franklin, what is now France, where they could raise and train horses, okay? So now they're all spread around. And at this time, um, well, first you have um, Charlemagne come along. He's a Carolingian. Notice the I-N-G. That means followers of a dude named Carol or Carl of a dude named Carol or Carl. Dude named Carol, Mom? Well, that's the part, first part of Carolingian. Right, right, right. The same okay. like female. So now what happens to the Carolingian Empire is the war brands spread all around because they're busy raising and training horses, and they get together every summer to practice their campaigns, and along come the invasions, and you've got a map of this. You've got the Vikings, on one side, you've got the Magyars coming down, you've got the Muslims coming up from the south, and here's a problem. So um, you have somebody there, what's somebody's name there? Uh, Piper. Uh, what is it? Piper. Piper? Yeah. Okay, so Piper's there, and he's sitting in his little, you know, um, manor over by the, the ocean, and here come the Vikings. So he gets somebody, and he says, quick, go off and get the king. So he dashes off to the king. Two and a half weeks later, he reaches the king. He says, we're being invaded by Vikings. And the king says, that's dreadful. So he sends for all his men. Now, all his men are all over the Franklin. He gets them all together and he says, quick, let's go save Kuiper. So about a month and a half later, they get to where Kuiper is now probably hiding in the pigsty under the mud. And they say, okay, we're here to save you, Kuiper. And Kuiper says, great. They've stolen my family to make slaves. They've taken everything. I have nothing left. Thanks a lot, King. So this wasn't working. So what happened gradually, you see what's happening is the Lord, the King is not protecting his people. So this is where you have the development of the people. Um, the, the, That's Piper, Mom. Kuiper, hello Kuiper. <laughs> so there she is now. Uh, she's hiding under the pigsty, <laughs> the the saying they've stolen all my family and they've taken all my stuff. So, and you, the king, is not protecting the people. So, Mom, so, when we were discussing this yesterday, this is the kind of the way that I presented to the kids, and I want to make sure it's correct. I said, if we're in our classroom when we're being attacked, and Mr. Elizondo, our principal, or actually I said Mr. Garcia, right, the band teacher, is all the way over, just, just can you hang up on that? I don't know what it is. Is all the way over on the other side of school. And I send someone to go get Mr. Garcia to come help us. By the time he gets back, uh, you know, all is lost. We've been overtaken by whoever's overtaking us. However, evil Mrs. aliens. Sarah, right, aliens. Mrs. Sarah is right across the hallway from me. If she, she continues to come over and protect me, 
uh, even though Mr. Garcia can't get here. I am now, after a few times of this happening, I'm now loyal to Mrs. Sarah, and I'm no longer really very loyal to Mr. Garcia, who's all the way over on the other side of the school, and it's not there. not protecting you, exactly. Okay. And this is when the feudal pyramid started, because each person looked to the one above him, that's close to him, to protect him. Okay. Um, and so the king, but what happened then is now the oaths were to the person who's closest to them, not everybody taking an oath to the king. So if the dukes out there decide, you know what? We've decided we're not going to be loyal to the king anymore. There are only four of us. And so we're just going to take this land and keep it. The king cannot do anything about it. But in the same way, if the counts decide after a few years, hey, why should we, why should we be loyal to the, the, uh, the duke? Then the dukes can't make them. And that goes all the way down. It was at this time that they got the bright idea of building stone castles. And then you, they would take one of their knives and then feet knight, and they would put him in the stone castle. But then guess what? They couldn't get him out of the castle because the, the castellan would sit there and say, I decided I want this castle. And they, the counts and things couldn't get, lords couldn't get them out. So, so they're, they're all turning to their devolution of power sheet because that's kind of what you're speaking to right now. Exactly. That, that started with the kings and then it moved down to the dukes and the counts. And by the time you get to the castle lines, they themselves are sort of sort of robbing the people. Is that right? And that's how we got to Oh, the yes. That, that's when you get the robber barons. They would sit up in their castle and if Kuiper or one of the others is going through as a as a, a merchant and you want to do trading and they would swoop down and they would take a bunch of your stuff and they would kill a bunch of people and then they would go up and take all the food and part of like rock stars. So um, that, and, and there's no, no way anyone could stop them because nobody could get into the castles. So that was when devolution of power went down. There was no justice. There was no maintaining law and order. Everybody was at the mercy. And of course, the villagers, the peasants, they weren't they didn't have um, um, weapons. The priests weren't allowed to fight. They weren't trained in weapons. So it was, it was really, really bad. They wouldn't dare till the fields. They couldn't do anything. So what happened? The king had lost all the power, and the, but the church still had authority. And that's when you have the peace and truce of God. So the church uses the only so-called power it has of excommunication. And that's when you've got the, the peace and truths of God. You see the first one, the peace of God. Who is it? It's the archbishop. Calls together the bishops and says, you know what? We have to do something to protect the people. And so they say, anathema, you're excommunicated if you break into a church, if you rob a church, okay? Unless you make satisfaction. You're excommunicated if you rob the poor or the peasants or anybody else, okay? Uh, excommunication to anyone who beats up anyone in the, in the church, okay? And guess what? It worked. Because remember, excommunication also meant anyone who looked after you, they say, you know what, I'm not going to cook for you anymore because you're, you're excommunicated. I'm not going to do that. So they would leave. And so all of a sudden, the rubber baron sitting up there by himself chewing his fingernails, maybe even his wife said, hey, you're excommunicated. I'm not going to hang out with you. And finally he says, oh, the heck with it. So he goes down, he says, all right, I'll stop doing this. I'll abide by the peace. And this is happening all over. When the counts lose power on your devolution of power, then they suddenly say, wait a minute, the peace of God is working. So they join with the church and that's the truce of God. And here you say, bishop, and the Count Baldwin are getting together and they're making the truce, during which time you cannot do all these things. And that was the beginning of the power that is the ability to maintain law and order, building back up into the hands of people who were going to abide by the law. I think one. I have what, one more minute? Yeah, we have one minute left. And there were no alligators in the moats. Sorry, we didn't get to the Vikings and the alligators in the moats, guys. The Vikings were professional fighters. They really got into it. They liked to go sh shopping in the summer at, in all their towns and places like that and take on whatever they wanted. <laughs> guys, can you say thank you to Dr. Beale? Thank you. 
Mom, we're going to send a link to you of thank you, like they're called a Padlet. So I will send you this tomorrow afternoon and you just click on the link and all these things thank yous will appear on a screen for you with some details about what the kids enjoyed the most about your lecture. And if anyone wants to send me more questions on, online, I will try to answer them. That would be great, Mom. Okay, I'm gonna bring in the tech person up here to help me make sure we have saved this correctly, okay? So I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye. Bye bye. Bye mom, thank you. I really appreciate it. You guys were awesome.